Hello, welcome to an adventure. I am Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, and this is Archival Adventures, um, a once a week, mostly, show <laughs> where we take a look at whatever we happen to find uh, from special collections and university archives. So uh, it's kind of like an unboxing. Most of the time, I've never seen this stuff. Um, uh, this show is live on both the uh, library's Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, as well as my own personal channel, twitch.tv slash Rogan27. So wherever you're watching, welcome. Um, still working on diversifying to more platforms. Not quite there yet, but uh, but yeah, let me see who's here. I, I know that I see a Hannah. Hi, Hannah. Thank you for uh, being here and disabling the um, emote only, because, yeah, I forgot to do that. Uh, <clears throat> Today we got some lo-fi going, and we're going to be looking at some interesting things. Um, since we are looking at history on this stream, we like to just, you know, take a nod and pay attention to the history of Virginia Tech at the very beginning. Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands in, in California and other areas in the West. Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude plantations owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. Enslaved Black people generated resources that financed Virginia Tech's predecessor institution, the Preston and Olin Institute, and they also worked on the construction of its building. <clears throat> The shorter versions definitely work better for time on the stream, but I'm, I've am i read the longer ones for like three years, and so <laughs> I stumbled a little bit while reading that. Um, <clears throat> so this week, we're focusing on ads. We're focusing on ads from the Speculative Fiction Pulp Magazine collection that we have, the Heron Speculative Fiction Collection. Um, and so these ads that we're going to look at, you can see here um, as far back as... Let's see. I don't know if, if Air Wonder Stories is goes back to 1884. I don't, I don't know that for sure. Uh, but... 1970s, 1930s, basically the first half of the 20th century generally, um, hitting for sure the 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, we are going to be looking at some pulp speculative fiction magazines, uh, <clears throat> and particularly paying attention to the advertisements therein, uh, we may look at other aspects of it, get a little background on the magazine itself, the, you know, those kinds of things that we normally do when I'm reading a story from one of them. But um, Sterling, who was picking topics, commented on uh, the ads in some of the magazines. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Um, so, how is everybody today? How are you? How are you doing? Is, is it a good Wednesday? It's gotten hotter. <laughs> it's, it's very warm here. Um, I think we're supposed to possibly finally get some rain uh and if we do tomorrow might be 
mid 80s instead of um up in the 90s it, it feels i feel sad being happy for mid 80s um <clears throat> let me pull up this first magazine here um which is going to be an issue of air wonder stories oh my gosh i missed this uh if anybody needs links to these during the stream let me know i can grab them um we changed catalog systems and these links do not work they, they are not the correct links i'm not going to take the time to correct them myself right now unless somebody needs them i'll correct them after stream so that anybody who goes to this uh, with the VODs will get the correct links. But um, those catalog links are incorrect. Uh, so if you need help finding one of those, I can certainly um, point you in the right direction. But that is also just me not realizing every single place where we had links. You don't need rain, at least not in the northern part of the state. You have a bunch of flooding. Um, that's what I'm sort of concerned with, is that we might we might end up in that state. We or not we we won't end up in the northern part of your state. Um boy, that would be a big flood. Uh we we may end up with some flooding uh if if we get some heavy rain. Um okay, so Air Wonder Stories. This is an issue from July 1929. A Gernsback publication, uh Hugo Gernsback, the editor. So before we dive in and look at some of the ads, let's find out a little bit about the magazine, if I can. like there is an entry in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction for Air Wonder Stories. U.S. Oh, gosh. My cursor was on the wrong screen, and I was like, why isn't it scrolling? Uh, U.S. Letter-Sized Pulp Magazine, 11 issues. Uh, July 29 is the first issue. <clears throat> Publishing company is Stellar Publishing edited by Hero Hugo Gernsback, and we'll take a look uh, just briefly at who that is. Managing editor David Lasser. Prompt comeback by Gernsback after filing of bankruptcy proceedings against his experimenter publishing company. Uh, which the <clears throat> So this was his endeavor after Amazing Stories. We've definitely looked at some of the Amazing Stories magazines on stream before. Uh, first announced itself in its first editorial as presenting solely flying stories of the future, strictly along scientific, mechanical, technical lines to prevent gross scientific aviation misinformation from reaching our readers. To this end, Gernsback hired three professors and one Air Corps Reserve major whose names appeared prominently on the masthead. I don't see see well we'll we'll find out <laughs> stories were mostly written by writers Gernsback had developed at amazing including edmund hamilton david keller uh ed earl rep harl vincent jack williamson raymond gallon uh okay covers were by frank paul interesting so these are meant to do hard science stories involving flight. Flying stories set in the future, but strictly along scientific, mechanical, technical lines. So that's the hard sci-fi. Um, so it shouldn't have like fantastical elements is what that means. Hugo Gernsback, working and perhaps eventually legal name of Luxembourg-born U.S. inventor, author, editor, and publisher, 
who emigrated to America in 1904 to market his, market his various minor inventions. A successful catalog of radio parts led to a focus on publishing magazines, mostly dealing with practical science or science fiction, though his most popular magazine may have been the mildly scandalous Sexology. I don't know if we have that. that I don't know if I can even... I think we have it. See, now I'm going to look. I don't I don't have it present with me here, but It's a name that I have seen before. Whether that means we have it, I do not know. Uh Wolf Iker, that's 1988. That's not it. Uh okay. Ah. So it shows as being loanable. Uh let me see. <laughs> I haven't quite figured out everything with this new system yet, but we definitely the library has it on microfiche. I don't know that we have it here in Special Collections. I'm just curious at this point. Show more. It does not want to show more. Yeah, it looks to me like we don't have it uh, and that we only, the library has it on um, microfiche. Anyway, that's neither here nor there when we get to advertisements in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> Growth and development of modern science fiction as a writer, editor, and critic he used an anagrammatic pseudonyms. Greno Gashbach, Kars Guggentob, and Gus N. Habergock for one short story apiece. <laughs> okay. Hi, Bit Rebellious. Um, so, what I would expect 1929, so post World War I, um, a magazine that is meant to be focusing on hard sci-fi. Uh, we should see advertisements in it, I'm guessing, that are going to be mainly aimed at, um, I would think, like, late teens to young adult white men, primarily. Um like military age white men because it's 1929. Um, that's my guess as to what types of ads or the, like targeting for the ads that we're going to see. Um, I have not looked at any of these yet. Uh, Sterling looked at them before, like while he was prepping this stuff for the episode, but I haven't looked at any of them. Um, I may actually also want to bring the camera higher um, just so that you all can see more of the page at once since this is a full US letter size um, magazine. Getting it high enough that you can see the cord. By the way, I filmed this live and the technology is sitting on the t desk in front of me. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, oh dear. It's getting a little bit of glare. Let's drop that one just a little. There. That seems okay. 
let's see what we can find in the in the way of advertisements. Well, right off the bat, right on the inside of the front cover, we have an ad for another speculative fiction magazine. Science Wonder Stories. Mechanics Dramatized Stories with a Scientific Background. Interplanetarian Trips. Space Flyers. Talking to Mars, transplanting heads of humans, death rays, gravity nullifiers, transmutation of elements. The editorial stuff of the magazine, or staff of the magazine. Hugo Gernsback, so advertising one of his other magazines. Uh, David Lasser, Frank Paul. The same three that are primarily responsible for the one that we're looking at. Uh, and then they've got associate science editors for this other magazine here. Um, Professor Samuel Barton from University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Clyde Fisher, the American Museum of Natural History. So they're really, really pushing the hard, it's hard sci-fi. It's, it's focused on the science rather than like fantasy. But that's not what we're primarily looking for. <laughs> with with ads in these, not surprised to see them advertising another magazine. But this is also an ad. Let's go in just a little bit and we'll take a look at this advertising. A supreme achievement in a model plane. The Red Ace. Combat pursuit ship. Boys, get this ship! Rises from ground, soars 60 feet. The development of the Red Ace combat pursuit ship will be nothing short of sensational in the world of model planes. Here's one plane that will not disappoint you. One plane that will perform like a real ship. Has wing spread 16 inches with main fuselage 14 inches. Reinforced main wing. Perfectly ba balanced tail wing and adjustable rudder. Main wing can be shaped to suit conditions. Has front landing gear and rear skid. The perfectly carved 7 inch wood propeller is a particularly fine feature. Has ball bearings on propeller shaft. Six ply motor of newly developed extra strong para rubber. This is not a construction set, but a completely assembled plane. Simply fasten wings and launch. Any estimates on the price? If you didn't see the price when I did the full screen, uh, give me guesses of how much you think it cost for this fully assembled model plane 16 inches by 14 inches um that you just have to add wings to and launch <clears throat> will outperform planes costing five times more the red ace will fly from ground under its own power will climb easily to 60 feet will soar over rooftops and buildings then glide perfectly to earth this large-sized, carefully made plane will outperform many planes, costing five times more. It is guaranteed to fly. It is guaranteed to rise from the ground under own power. This plane will please any boy immensely. A perfect marvel of simplicity and powerful performance. Whether you now own a model plane or not, whether you own 50 model planes, you will want the Red Ace. It will be the prize ship in your hangar. Don't let a day slip by until you order this plane. You may have it free! <laughs> and here's the price. A dollar. <clears throat> or free. Apparently free. Free is also a price. 
The Open Road for Boys magazine has 50 pages every month crammed with thrilling, breathtaking stories that will hold you spellbound. Any boy? Seriously? I know it's the 1920s, but still, I know Hannah. Like it, but it is definitely, <clears throat> as I predicted, I, I expected that the ads would be targeted towards males. Um, and yeah. Incidentally, when were the first female pilots uh, making the news? I don't know the dates off the top of my head. I'm going to look. First American Women in Flight. Thank you, National Air and Space Museum. Uh, Bessica Raish. Practicing Physician. On September 16th, 1910, Bessica Raish made the first accredited solo flight by a woman in the United States. Raish was considered a new woman of the 20th century because she drove an automobile and wore bloomers. In addition to being an accomplished musician, painter, and linguist, she also participated in typically masculine activities as swimming and shooting. <clears throat> While studying music in Paris, Raish became intrigued by the flying of the Baroness Raymond de la Roche. Blanche Stewart Scott uh, followed up in... <clears throat> Let's see, when was her flight? Made her debut as a member of the Curtis team at a Chicago air meet in October of 1910, Harriet Quimby. August 1st, 1911, got her flying certificate. So definitely by 1929, <clears throat> it was clear that women were pilots. And yet, as Hannah points out, this ad is entirely focused on boys wanting to fly model planes. <laughs> um, as is growing boys magazine in America, you'll think it's great. Regular subscription price, $1 a year. Yeah, subscribe to the Open Road for Boys magazine and they'll give you the plane for free. So it's got the rudder, the tail wing, six ply elastic motor, composition wings, wing support, seven inch carved wood propeller, ball bearing, front landing skids. I wonder if it's balsa wood. Um, like, that's what it would be today. But I, I don't know what wood they would have been using in 1929 for the model plane. Come on. Thank you. Uh, the Red Ace is a plane so carefully thought out, so cleverly constructed that it will enable you to compete with other boys with the most expensive planes and win. This plane is a remarkable performer, a plane that you will be proud of. Well, <clears throat> I don't recommend sending a dollar to this address in Massachusetts because I highly doubt that they will send you a plane. But apparently, $1 US in 1929 would get you the most spectacular model airplane, the Red Ace. <clears throat> Canadian postage, 50 cents extra. International, as they term it, foreign, 
dollar extra. All right, let's see what we got. Oh, another ad already on page three. It almost doesn't look like an ad. It looks like an article. You can tell it's an ad because it has the little uh, dotted line to cut out and send back a thing. <clears throat> Men of action wanted for commercial electrical engineering. At the request of the United States government, S of E, Secretary of Education, uh, students made the acceptance test of this huge electrical generating unit consisting of 4,000 horsepower Nordberg diesel engine uh, <clears throat> direct connected to 3125 kilowatt, 2300 volt uh, <clears throat> Alice Chalmers generator built for the Panama Canal. Big Milwaukee electrical concerns join hands with the School of Engineering to meet the stupendous demand for trained men. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Takes you out of the class of the common laborer of which there is always an over-plentiful supply at cheap rates of pay. Makes you a graduate electrician, junior electrical engineer, or commercial electrical engineer in 12 short months. <clears throat> puts you in line for a job where big manufacturers are actually pleading for trained men and glad to pay big salaries, ranging from $2,000 to $10,000 a year. Not a dream, a dead sure fact. For 24 years, we have trained men for the electrical profession, and our graduates have succeeded in all parts of the world. <clears throat> our 12 months intensive training is the boiled down essence of what we know fits men for big paying positions. It is work you'll love. No limit to advancement. Practical engineers teach you. They know what to teach and how to teach it. So you can earn money with it. Hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of actual commercial machinery to work on in this school. Uncle Sam asks S of E, okay. <clears throat> I don't understand that sentence. Again, I, I'm uncertain. I, I'm guessing it's S, I'm guessing S of E is School of Engineering. <clears throat> Where I thought it was Secretary of Education earlier, but I'm pretty sure it's School of Engineering now. Um, think of the opportunity to test plants such as this. The Nordberg Manufacturing Company is only one of many large concerns that is operating with School of Engineering students. This type of practical work while in school ensures your future when you graduate. That's why our men are always in demand and always command big salaries. You can be one of these men if you act. Earn while you learn. Be our tip, be our buy. That says buy. <clears throat> By our special system, you may earn part of your way while learning. Our employment department will help you secure a position to which you may devote a part of each day, spending the remainder at the school. This plan both solves the student's financial problems and provides splendid experience at the same time. Low tuition fee, board and room reasonable, daily broadcasting, WISN, formerly WSOE, school orchestra. Fraternities, write for free catalog. Write today for our free illustrated catalog. Read about this wonderful institution and the great opportunities that lie before you. Find out about our specialized method of training and the details of our earn while you learn plan. <sighs> okay. So it's the School of Engineering of Milwaukee. Interesting. <laughs> I'm trying to think. So this is July 1929. And. 
the Wall Street crash was when? Autumn. Began in September. So this is before the stock market crash, before the Great Depression started, um, but not long before. These are very, very wordy ads. I'm not surprised. It's 1929. But also, like, we have yet to get to content for the magazine. We're on page four, and it's another ad. <clears throat> I'm going to leave it on screen for just a second. I need to grab my water bottle, which I forgot to grab. Um, so give me one second. Okay, <laughs> this should be a little better now that I will have water. Ah, uh, Key Squared, hi! Thank you for the resubscription, 35 months. <clears throat> well, let's see here. Late, but you finally made it? Hey, that's fine. I tried streaming today under just chatting instead of talk shows and podcasts, and I don't know if that will affect <clears throat> discoverability at all. They really need, like, a learning and education category. But as of right now, it doesn't exist. <clears throat> A lot of other educational streams fit under the science and technology category, and we kind of don't because not everything that we end up featuring is science related. <sighs> Unless you count archival science. Anyway, the best that's in radio, the 100% radio magazine, Radiocraft. <clears throat> Pretty obvious why this ad is here. Editor Hugo Gernsback. <laughs> the same editor as this magazine. Uh, subscription price, eight issues for a dollar. I'm going to skip. We finally actually get to content on page five. There's an S in the degree... Abbreviation, it counts? What degree abbreviation? I missed something. Oh. <clears throat> um, sorry, the S. Archival science. Brain. M-L-I-S. Yes. Master of Library and Information Science. I may try it at some point. We'll see. I, I, I don't know yet. Um, ooh. Ooh. I think maybe... Let me check. I just realized there's some bookmarks in here, and maybe Sterling marked specific spots. Indeed. Maybe. Or not. I think that's a story. Or... Let me check the table of contents, because we have... Uh, no, this is definitely a story. Men with Wings by Leslie Stone. So... I wonder why that was bookmarked. It's interesting. 
uh, art, but not not an ad. We're looking for the ads today. We're particularly focusing on the things that we don't typically focus on. <clears throat> Aviation news of the month. Also not an ad. Hmm. Oh, let me see what ads I can find. It does seem like it was it was very ad heavy at the front of this issue, uh, but not as many back here. You can see this is it, it is certainly falling apart. Most of the pages have come out. Um, not they're not stitched together anymore. Um, and they're very brittle. Uh, you'll see there will be bits of paper. Um, when I move the magazine off, because it's a pulp magazine and they were made on cheap paper. <clears throat> it's, it's actually very yellow paper. Um, it, it, so... This is, this is white paper. This is like modern printer paper. So you can see how yellowed this paper is in comparison. Um, and that's because it's got uh, plenty of acid in it. It's very acidic paper, um, and which makes it yellow over time. Let's see. Five books for 50 cents. Brand new science fiction stories. We are presenting to our readers the first six numbers of our new science fiction series. The editors of Science Wonder Stories have received such a large supply of really excellent science fiction stories that we have decided to publish some of them in book form. These small books illustrated by artist Paul are printed on a good grade of paper and are sold at a low price due to the large amount put out. The series, in time, will form a beautiful library of the best that is to be had in science fiction. New ones will be issued from time to time. Remember, these are brand new stories and have not been published before and will not be printed in any magazine. They can only be secured through the science fiction series. Every, no, every book contains but a single story by a well-known science fiction author. The type is large and well-readable, and the size of each book is six inches by inches. That's what it says. Six inches x inches. Which makes it convenient to carry them in your pocket. Indeed, if it's six inches tall and zero inches wide, it is very convenient to carry in your pocket. <clears throat> Not less than five books sold. We accept cash, money order, or U.S. no foreign postage stamps. Below, you will find a list of the first six books, your choice of five books for 50 cents, or the entire six books for 60 cents prepaid. All orders filled promptly. In the ad for how well printed your books are, <laughs> you manage to have a typo. Indeed. Um, <clears throat> I'm also just, it reminds me of like the CD subscription series or the, ca the cassette tape sub subscription things that were, um, around in like the nineties. That's what it reminds me of. Pick X number and then an ongoing subscription, but except that this one doesn't include the ongoing subscription. <clears throat> the Girl from Mars by Jack Williamson and Miles Brewer. Uh, the Thought Projector by David Keller. An Adventure in Venus by R. Michael Moore. When the Sun Went Out by Leslie Stone. The Brain of the Planet by Lilith Lorraine, and When the Moon Fell by Charles Colliday. Interesting. 
So this is sort of like the beginning of paperback books. I'm looking up now to just get a primer on the history of the paperback soft cover or soft back. The early days of modern paperbacks was 1930s and 40s. <clears throat> so... Interesting. I'm just looking at the Wikipedia article, which notes that Pocket Books uh, was the first American paperback publisher, officially. Um, and Wuthering Heights was one of their first pocket books. And they published that in 1939. So this is 10 years before that. The early 19th century saw numerous improvements in printing. <clears throat> Let's see. Sims and McIntyre of Belfast, Routledge and Sons, and Ward Unlock. Cheap, uniform, yellowback or paperback editions of existing works and distribute and sell them across the British Isles. Paper-bound volumes were offered for sale at a fraction of the historical cost of a book were a smaller format. Uh, four and three-eighths inches by seven inches, or 110 millimeters by 178 millimeters, aimed at the railway traveler. <clears throat> The Routledge's Railway Library series of paperbacks remained in print until 1898. I've heard of the Routledge, Routledge Routledge's Railway series before. <clears throat> and then the German publisher Albatross Books re revised the 20th century mass market paperback format in 1931. 35, Alan Lane. So the first book on Penguin's 35 list it was, was, sorry, it was in 1935. The Pocket Books label wasn't created until 1939. So this is like, it's not unheard of because there were people doing it in Ireland and England before this, but it's before paperback books have really taken off as a format. Um, so the fact that these are meant to be pocket-sized individual stories in a book, these are the precursor to the paperback. Williamson is the only one of those that you think is even still in print today or even much remembered. I think, yeah, I don't know, actually. Uh, I could look up some of them if, if we want to know. Let us learn. Um, so Jack Williamson, <clears throat> working name of U.S. author John Stuart Williamson. He started in 1928. And ah, it's a chap book. That's what it is. That is a very specific kind of book. I have lost my cursor. <laughs> Where's my cursor? Um, so I was reading the paperback uh, entry here. But if it's a chapbook, that's a different thing. Type of small printed booklet. 
that was a popular medium for street literature throughout early modern Europe. So it's going to be more like this than like what we would think of as a paperback. And that makes more sense based on the illustration in here that it would be more of a chapbook than a um than a full paperback, but definitely chapbooks were precursors to the paperback. Um <clears throat> Oh jeez. I'm reading it there, but I need to type there, and I somehow always mess that up. So yeah, uh, there have been collected stories of Jack Williamson published as recently as 2011. Yeah. Reg Michael Moore, U.S. author of Whom Nothing is Known Beyond an Adventure of in Venus, the 1929 chapbook advertised in this ad. They know nothing about this author except this publication that we just saw, read an ad for. <laughs> I love that. <clears throat> uh, Leslie Stone is Leslie Francis Rubenstein. Pseudonym. In the in her non writing life, she took the surname of the journalist William Silverberg, whom she married in 1927. She began publishing light, non-fantastic fiction as early as 1920. Interesting. And Men with Wings was her first science fiction tale. All right. Lilith Lorraine, one of at least five pseudonyms of Mary Maud Wright, U.S. poet, editor, radio lecturer, and author who regularly published science fiction in the 1930s pulp magazines. The Brain of the Planet, uh, which is the one advertised here, portrays a feminist utopia founded after a socialist revolution has released women from the necessity of marriage. Uh, and it looks like there's stuff of hers that's been, uh, collected works, like, published in, in 2009, at least. Leslie Stone. Doesn't look like any publications since 67. You've heard of her as M.M. Wright? Yeah. Uh, a lot of... A lot of the pulp era sci-fi authors published under multiple names. Uh, Charles Colliday. Form of his name used for only, uh, one story only, only by the author who most often wrote as Morrison Colliday. So Morrison Colliday. Looks like he was not particularly prolific and that the book that he published for this might have been his only one. Interesting. Hmm. Okay, let's see what else we've got here. We've got some, ooh. Is that, it's been an hour and we're on the first magazine and I have more, more decades for us to look at, but learn to fly where Lindbergh learned. 
we have more calls for oil for oil we have more calls for our graduates than we can fill one factory just called on us for 20 more men the demand for lincoln trained men is greater than we can supply and this demand is constantly increasing take advantage of this wonderful opportunity come to lincoln the school where Lindbergh learned get thorough practical training as a pilot ground mechanic or plane well airplane welder then in a few short months you can step into a good pay position we help our graduates get jobs many right here in lincoln's two big aircraft factories and three airports we also help students get part-time work to defray expenses lincoln airplane school where lincoln where Lindbergh learned <laughs> too many l's lincoln nebraska <clears throat> <laughs> Wikipedia reports that Williamson may have been the person to introduce the terms genetic engineering and psionics. Though in both cases, uh, yeah, it, usually the um, there's some uncertainty with those. It's it's not very often that you get something like blustery that is very attributable to a specific author. Uh, and then we end with another model airplane, but the, oh, this one is one that requires assembly. Oh, but you can also learn electricity. Not by correspondence. In 12 weeks. Ah, oh, let me, let me move on to another book. Uh, let's see. I'm just gonna see what catches my eye real quick. Yes. I won't necessarily. Uh, I have, I have an entire box of this magazine. So, let's see. What do we want to look at? I've got. May of 1930 could be a good one to look at. These are also in somewhat fragile condition. January of 1930. What was this one? December of 29. Eh, let's look at the January 1931, just because I'm curious. Or <clears throat> when is this one? February? All right. Let's look at January real quick. Uh, since what happened in Fall of 1929. What was happening in January of 1930? The start of the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression and all of that is, is happening. So let's see what the advertisements were like. Uh... I want to look at it, but I also don't want to mess with the... The cover is, is very attached, and I don't want to detach it. Let RCA Institutes start you on the road to success in radio. Radio needs you. That's why the entire radio industry is calling for trained men. That's why thousands of men who answered these advertisements are now earning from $2,000 and up a year. Radio is thrilling work. Easy hours, too. Vacations with pay and a chance to see the world. Manufacturers and broadcasting stations are now eagerly seeking trained RCA men. 
aviation and radio in the movies also provide innumerable opportunities. Millions of sets need servicing. Thousands of ships require experienced operators. Never before was there an opportunity like this. This is the only course sponsored by Radio Corporation of America. That's what RCA stands for. Did you know that RCA stands for Radio Corporation of America? <clears throat> RCA sets the standards for the entire radio industry. The RCA Institute's Home Laboratory Training Course enables you to quickly learn all the secrets of radio in your spare time. In only an hour or so a day, you can obtain a thorough practical education in radio. You get the inside information too because you study right at the source of all the latest up to the minute developments. RCA, the world's largest radio organization, sponsors every single detail in this course. You learn radio by actual experience with the remarkable outlay of apparatus given to every student. You learn the how as well as the why of every radio problem, such as repairing, installing, and servicing fine sets. That's why every graduate of RCA Institutes has the experience, the ability, and the confidence to hold a big money radio job. Are there big money radio jobs today? <clears throat> Graduates of RCA Institutes find it easier to get good jobs. They are closest to the source of radio's greatest achievements because the progress of radio is measured by the accomplishments of the great engineers in the huge research laboratories of the Radio Corporation of America. Students of RCA Institutes get first-hand knowledge, get it quickly and get it complete. Success in radio depends upon training, and that's the training you get with RCA Institutes. That's why every graduate who desires or desired a position has been able to get one. That's why graduates are always in big demand. Who has the time to read an entire ad like this? I mean, I guess in 1930, lots of people, because they didn't have jobs. But this is very wordy. <laughs> and interestingly enough, very similar to the ads that were in um, July of 1929. It's not like they suddenly were advertising <clears throat> careers. They were advertising careers before the stock market crash. Oh, but... Again, targeted at men. Absolutely. Uh, we have something that might be familiar to anybody who's paid any attention to this sort of thing before. Tricks, magic, instruction. For 25 years, the management of this firm has sold merchandise by mail. This is our guarantee to you. We promise courteous treatment and prompt shipment. We prepay all orders over 50 cents. Remit 5 cents extra for all orders below 50 cents. A remit by check, money order, or U.S. postage stamps. Canadian and foreign stamps not accepted. <clears throat> order direct from this page. Money refunded. Goods unsatisfactory. So, what are the things that they're offering for sale to the anticipated young male readers of this speculative fiction magazine. Let's me... I'm going to... try to zoom in here. Fluoroscope. This is a fine imported combination microscope. Really two instruments in one. One end used for high magnification such as seeing bacteria. Let me... Try not to wobble quite so much. Other end to see parts of insects, flower specimens, etc. Finished in gold brass. 
magnifies about 25 diameters, 65 cents. Uh, microscope magnifier, ooh la la ring. Handsomely carved platinum finish looks just like any other ring, but oh boy, wait till you look through the view. Strong magnifying glass shows French actress when viewed against light. Ring has large imitation diamond. When ordering, enclose a strip of paper giving size of your finger. 35 cents. <laughs> you squared, she appears to have clothing on at least. <laughs> I'm not at all surprised by that one. Let's see. Periscope, microscope, another microscope, multiple microscopes here. Uh, compass, x ray tube. Haven't seen x ray glasses yet. Oh, geez. Wonder scopes. What are wonder scopes, I wonder? New. Greatest pocket microscope invented. Looks like a fountain pen and actually magnifies 25 times. Hair looks as big as a rope. See the pores in your skin. Has slide adjustable lens for home laboratory or shop. Full black enamel with clip. Its size measures 5 inches by 3 eighths inch. Must be seen to be appreciated. Wonderscope A, 95 cents. Wonderscope B, same as above, but adjustable to the amount of light available. $1.35. Luminous paint, nose blower. Ah, it's a gag gift. Let me see. Bluff gun, imp in the bottle. Uh, humanitone? Anyone can play. I'm gonna. Sorry, I can't. I can't seem to hold it steady. I apologize. My hands are too shaky. Anyone can play a humanitone. A unique and novel musical instrument played with nose and mouth combined. Produces sweet-toned music similar to a flute. No fingering, no lessons. A little practice and you'll get the knack. Made entirely out of metal. Nothing to get out of order or wear out. Ten cents. The bluff gun. Does the bluff gun shoot out a little flag that says bang like in the cartoons? I don't know. Let's see. Uh. Do, 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 do. Come on. Bluff your friends with this gun. Made of composition metal handsomely nickeled. Exactly same size, weight, and shape as real article. Fine to bluff burglars. Used also as desk paperweight. Size of this gun is six and a quarter inches long and three inches wide. 65 cents. It does not, Hannah. <clears throat> but that would get you killed today. Oh boy. Um microscopes, big magic set, real pistol. Here's a real pistol, yet small enough to be used as a watch charm. Illustration is full size. Imported best European workmanship. Excellent reproduction of standard pistol. Cut shows pistol broken open to load blank cartridge. When trigger is pulled, cartridge goes off with a loud bang that can be heard for a block. Pistol entirely made of steel, nickel-plated. Handle is beautifully engraved. Octagonal barrel. Comes in box with cleaning rod and 25 blank cartridges at no extra charge. As explosives are, as explosives are prohibited to go by mail, pistol is sent express collect. $1.20, and then they sell an additional 25 cartridges for 25 cents. Cigarette gun actually shoots cigarettes. Luminous skeleton. Telescopes. Blackstone's magic. Telegraph codes. Wizard deck. I know that I would love to see one of those because that's apparently the act 
actual size. And I don't have a I don't have a tape measure with me right at this second, but I don't have anything to measure with. Um, it's very small. Oh, I have paper clips. Let's see. How big are these paper clips? Um Is that like an inch? I don't know how big a paper clip is. Anyway, compare the size to this paper clip. I'll, I'll put in a bigger paper clip just for reference. It's a very small real pistol. If this is depicted in actual size as it says. Uh, yeah. I'm sure we'll, we'll see some more of similar things at some point. Let's, um, we have Electric Library, seven book, or a, a book set. Uh, okay, there's one ad that I saw in February of 1930 that I want to look at, and then we're going to move on to the next title, because we've spent a lot of time with Air Wonder Stories in the 19, uh, 1929, 1930, and there are more decades to look at. <clears throat> Muscles, five cents a piece! Wouldn't it be great if we could buy muscles by the bag? Take them home and paste them on our shoulders. I feel like this ad would work today. <clears throat> then our rich friends with money, uh, with money to buy them, sure would be sh socking us all over the lots. But they don't come that easy, fellows. If you want muscle, you have to work for it. That's the reason why the lazy fellow can never hope to be strong, so if you're lazy and don't want to work, you'd better quit right here. This talk was never meant for you. I want live ones! I've been making big men out of little ones for over 15 years. I've made pretty near as many strong men as Heinz has made pickles. My system never fails. That's why I guarantee my works to do the trick. That's why they gave me the name The Muscle Builder. I have the surest bet that you've ever heard of. Eugene Sandov himself said that my system is the shortest and surest that America ever had to offer. Follow me closely now and I'll tell you a few things I'm going to do for you. Here's what I guarantee to do for you. In just 30 days, I'm going to increase your arm one full inch, yes, and add two inches to your chest in the same length of time. But that's nothing. I've only started. Get this. I'm going to put knobs of muscle on your shoulders like baseballs. I'm going to deepen your chest so that you will double your lung capacity. Each breath you take will flood every crevasse of your pulmonary cavity with oxygen. This will load your blood with red corpuscles, shooting life and vitality throughout your entire system. I'm going to give you arms and legs like pillars. I'm going to work on every inner muscle as well, toning up your liver, your heart, etc. <clears throat> You'll have a snap to your step and a flash to your eye. You'll feel the real pep shooting up and down your old backbone. You'll stretch out your big brawny arms and cra- and what? <laughs> Sorry. You'll stretch out your big brawny arms and crave for a chance to crush everything before you. You'll, ju you'll just bubble over with vim and animation. Sounds pretty good, what? <clears throat> you can bet your old ukulele it's good. It's wonderful. 
And don't forget, fellow, I'm not just promising all this. I guarantee it. Well, let's get busy. I want some action. So do you. <clears throat> Earl Lederman, the muscle builder, author of Muscle Building, Science of Wrestling and Jiu-Jitsu, Secrets of Strength, Here's Health, Endurance, etc. Send for my new 64-page book, Muscular Development. It is free. Do you get that? It's free. I don't ask a cent. It's yours with my compliments. Take it and read it. It's the peppiest piece of literature you ever flashed your eyes on. And 48 full-page photos of myself and some of my numerous prize-winning pupils. <laughs> this is the finest collection of strong men ever <laughs> I broke. <clears throat> this is the finest. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to finish. I'm sorry. This is the finest collection of strong men ever assembled into one book. Look them over. Doctors, lawyers, merchants, mechanics, and every line of trade you can think of. I swear, you'll never let this book You'll never let this book get out of your hands again. And just think, you're getting it for nothing. Don't hesitate. No strings attached to it. Grab it. Take your pen or pencil and fill out the coupon. Or even your name and address on a postal will do. Do it now before you turn this page. I'm sorry. The, um... Just reading the advertisement of how it features 48 full page photos of himself and some of his numerous prize winning pupils, the finest collection of strong men ever assembled into one book. Look them over. I'm like, boy, I can just imagine how many of those sold to the young gay men of the time. <laughs> Who definitely would be very interested in the photos of the strong men in the book. And and just the way that it kept kept going and highlighting that it's full of pictures of muscle men, which would typically be wearing very little clothing, oiled up and showing off their muscles. I was just, it, it, I just broke a little bit. I couldn't stick with it. But <clears throat> I, I saw this, this ad and was like, oh, we have to read this ad. But uh, <laughs> holy ableism, Batman, yeah. So fitness scammers are definitely not a new thing. Oh no, this, this one, in fact, I, I mean, I do not know. He seems to have published a number of works. He might be, he might have been totally legit in that he could give you good advice on how to get fit. No idea. All I know is that this reads like an ad for patent medicine. It, it reads like a snake oil salesman ad. Um, until you get to the free book called Muscular Development that reads like a porno mag ad. Um, <clears throat> not an ad that would be in one, but an ad for one. Anyway, I just, that one just, I thought it was interesting. Um, but we should look at the next title. And uh, remember I said um, <clears throat> you would have evidence of the pulp nature of these publications? Indeed. What you see there 
are little bits of paper. That's little bits of the pages of that of those magazines that just broke off just from handling the magazine. Like I wasn't doing anything special to them. I was being very gentle with them and it's just really cheap paper, very dry, very acidic, and it crumbles like this. Um, but that's, that's pulp. That's what pulp, that's why they were called pulp is because they were cheap paper that would fall apart. This actually wasn't too bad. Wasn't too bad. Um, the next one that we have here. So that was nineteen twenties and thirties. Let's go to the forties. Startling stories, volume eleven, summer nineteen forty four to winter nineteen forty five. See what we got. <clears throat> okay, so startling stories. I think just by looking at the covers, you can probably guess the primary audience for these for this magazine. But I will I will look it up in uh, the encyclopedia here. Old man pulp art. <laughs> Um, oh, ah, finds three. Okay, I, I want this one. Startling stories. Oh, I love, like, the, the, the style of art. It's actually a very interesting, like, very iconic art style. I mean, the clothing that is present, the depiction of women wearing armor that is completely useless as armor. Uh, like, yeah, it's it's got issues as far as like the content and the misogyny and racism and, and whatnot that end up being present in the art itself, but the art style, <clears throat> I, I actually don't know the technical name for this art style. It's not one of the periods I paid particular attention to uh, when I was doing art history in college, because um, most of my art history focused on uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Oceania. So I don't know the like genre title for this style of art. But it is a very iconic art style. Um, and you can see definitely the, the 1940s styling in the clothing and the hairstyles that are depicted. Um, so... Hi, Pretty Witchery. You nearly bought fabric with a bunch of lesbian pulp covers on it. You should. It's very, where do I wear this in my 9,000 person town? Everywhere. <laughs> and yes, Oceania totally includes where you are. Um, uh, my specific classes in Oceania, I focused more on um, Polynesia and the Hawaiian Islands specifically and, and the, the history of art there. But um <clears throat> yeah, Australia and New Zealand are definitely part of that whole Oceania. But it would make excellent throw pillars if the throw pillows for the couch. Yes. Okay, so this is a US pulp magazine uh published between January 1939 and fall of 1955. 
started as a companion magazine to Thrilling Wonder Stories, whereas Thrilling Wonder Stories printed only shorter fiction. The policy of Startling was to include a complete novel, albeit sometimes very short, per issue. In its early years, the cover bore the legend, a novel of the future complete in this issue. None of these three issues <clears throat> say that, but this one does have Strangers on the Heights, an astounding complete novel by Manly Wade Wellman. Um, but yeah, so let's let's take a look at some ads. And you can see, I just cleaned away all of the bits of paper from the previous pulp, and we've already got Pulp paper. I, I'd say that this art style feels very much like the original series of Star Trek. Only, like, I, I, in a, in like television styling versus art like still art i this style this this artistic style feels very similar to the original series of star trek and i i'll have to dig into that cuz i don't actually know and uh, if none of you know then i'm i'm not going to spend the time to to look today but i i'm now curious as to what is the name of that art style <clears throat> ooh Anybody need batteries? Here we are, 19 something. What issue is this? Summer, 1944. And we have an ad for a brand that you may have heard of. <laughs> Where are my snakes? Uh, snake weights, and I, I lost one of them. It, it, it wandered off. Um, zoom in. So we can focus on the battery ad. Lighter moments with fresh, ever-ready batteries. You're violating the blackout, Sergeant! A thought to keep in mind, next time your dealer is out of ever-ready flashlight batteries, nearly all we can make right now are being put to good use by either the armed forces or essential war industries. You personally can save a soldier's life by giving a pint of blood to the Red Cross. They maintain blood donor centers in 35 cities. Call for an appointment now fresh batteries last longer. Look for the date line. <clears throat> the word ever ready is a registered trademark of National Carbon Company Incorporated. Your dealer? Are batteries equal to drugs? Yeah, next time your dealer is out of ever ready flashlight batteries. Interesting that that's the phrasing they used. <clears throat> Um, this next ad I am uncertain about. Do you worry about rupture? Does anybody know what this is about? Because at the moment I don't, but I'm scared. <clears throat> Why put up with days, months, years of discomfort, worry, and fear if we can help you? Learn now about this perfected truss innovation for most forms of reducible rupture. Surely you keenly desire, you eagerly crave to enjoy most of life's activities and pleasures once again, to work, to play, 
to live, to love, with the haunting fear of rupture lessened in your thoughts. Literally thousands of rupture sufferers have entered this kingdom of paradise regained. Perhaps we can do as much, uh, perhaps we can do as much for you. Some wise man said, <clears throat> nothing is impossible in this world, and it is true. For where other trusses have failed is where we have had our greatest success in many cases. Even doctors, thousands of them, have ordered for themselves and their patients. Unless your case is absolutely hopeless, do not despair. The coupon below brings our free rupture book in plain envelope. Send the coupon now. <clears throat> Why not give nature a chance? As long as your rupture can be put back and held in place with the, with the fingers, in other words, if your rupture is completely reducible, why block all hope for a natural recovery by wearing something that prevents nature from working for you? Why not help nature by using the Brooks patented air cushion support that works with natural physical laws and helps most ruptures gently but securely? I'm still uncertain what they're talking about. I'm beginning to get a possible idea. Sometimes, sometimes, as thousands of Brooks customers have reported, nature has done a such a good job that the use of their trust has been given up. Mind you, we don't expect such results in most cases, but the fact remains that in many cases they have been achieved. Find out. Write for free rupture book. Write for free rupture book. Cheap sanitary, comfortable. Rich or poor, anyone can afford to buy this remarkable, low-priced rupture invention. <clears throat> but look out for imitations uh, and counter... What? Sorry. Ones that work with unnatural physical laws would be more fun. This is true. It is a science fiction magazine. Uh, <clears throat> but look out for imitations and counterfeits. The genuine Brooks Air Cushion Truss is never sold in stores uh, or by agents. Okay, stop bouncing. Thank you. Your Brooks is made up after your order is received. To fit your particular case, you buy direct at the low maker to user price. Uh, the perfected Brooks is sanitary, lightweight, inconspicuous, has no hard pads to gouge painfully into the flesh, no stiff punishing springs, no metal girdle to rust or corrode. It brings heavenly comfort and security in most cases, while the patented air cushion continually works to help nature. Learn what this patented invention may mean to you. Send coupon quick. I still don't know. What rupture is a euphemism for? Sent on trial. No, don't order a Brooks now. First, get the complete revealing explanation of this world famous rupture invention. Then decide whether you want to try for the comfort, the wonderful degree of freedom from fear and worry, the security, the blessed relief thousands of men, women, and children have reported. They found our invention the answer to their prayers. <clears throat> and you risk nothing as the complete appliance is sent on trial. Surely you owe it to yourself to investigate this no-risk trial. Send for the facts now, today. Hurry, all correspondence strictly confidential. Free, last rupture book explains all. Latest, sorry, latest. <clears throat> sent to you in plain envelope. Just clip and send coupon. Where's your rupture?
that's part of why I don't understand what they're talking about. Proof! Proof of the value and outstanding merit of the Brooks Appliance is clearly shown by the fact that over 9,000 doctors have ordered it for themselves or their patients. One doctor alone has ordered for his patients over 400 Brooks Appliances. Follow your doctor's advice! If he says you have a reducible rupture and advises a proper fitting support, don't subject yourself to further delay, which may prove dangerous. But send us your name and address immediately. Stop your rupture worries. Enjoy the comfort, freedom, and action. Uh, enjoy the comfort, freedom of action, and physical security, which this made-to-order appliance will give you. Hi, Blue Opal. Uh, I wonder if it means hernia. I kind of think so. <clears throat> the page is vaguely upsetting, and I can't really say why. I indeed, I agree. Um, I'm, I'm going to do a somewhat possibly risky general internet search. I won't do it on screen because I have no idea what the results are going to be. Um, Um, the link you posted will help. Pop art question. Oh, with the pop art. Pop. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to drop it in the other chat too. Um, Slang terms and code words. Rupture. I don't think that this is it. No. Oh, yeah, no, that's that's not at all what I'm looking for. Thank you very much, though. Um I have no idea. And because apparently rupture is the name of is a um slang term for PCP, I'm not finding um the appropriate usage of the term as a euphemism or slang. <clears throat> I initially had thought that they were using rupture to refer to flatulence. And then I was thinking it was hemorrhoids. But given the possible locations on the body where they are indicating that you might have a rupture, I'm guessing that Blue Opal is correct in that they're referring to a hernia of some sort. Um, because that could happen in all of these various places. So that's my guess is, and hernia is a Latin word meaning rupture. Yes, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's what they mean. But yeah, I was like, I don't know. <clears throat> oh, it's just called pulp illustration. Thank you. I just, I love it. It's a great art style. And it's from a very iconic period in time. Um, okay, let's see what else we got. Radio technician. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just, I, I read this and, um, if you are not familiar with, um, <clears throat> the Rocky Horror Picture Show, 
you'll want to familiarize yourself with it after we read this ad. Because there is a direct reference to this ad in the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Lend me 15 minutes a day and I'll prove I can make you a new man. <clears throat> I'm trading in old bodies for new. I'm taking men who know that the condition of their arms, shoulders, chests, and legs, their strength, wind, and endurance is not 100%. And I'm making new men of them. And now you have the song stuck in your head. I mean, I do too. <clears throat> I don't care how old or young you are, or how ashamed of your present physical condition you may be. If you can simply raise your arm and flex it, I can add solid muscle to your biceps. Yes, on each arm. In double quick time, I can broaden your shoulders, strengthen your back, develop your whole muscular system inside and out. I can add inches to your chest, give you a vice-like grip, make, thing, <laughs> make those legs of yours lithe and powerful. I can shoot new strength into your old backbone. Exercise those inner organs. Wow, that's it's very hard to read. We're going closer. <clears throat> uh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. He looks like Tom Forrest or Tom, Tom Hanks. <laughs> See me reading two lines together. Thank you, Hannah, for the link. Let me let me take a look. And we'll get back to the Charles Atlas ad here in a second. <clears throat> Rupture. Tearing or disruption of tissue to forcibly disrupt tissue. Solution of continuity of tear, break of any organ. A hernia, especially of the groin or intestines. Yeah, so it's just not how we use the word today, which is not at all unusual. We often encounter different uses of terminology um, where a word that we are quite familiar with means something completely different uh, in the context that we encounter it <clears throat> which is honestly really fun for me um ooh, incoming whimsies i shall hold for one second and then we shall greet the arrival of the whimsies <clears throat> hello 16-bit eric thank you so much for the raid uh welcome whimsies welcome to archival adventures um, hi, Tumor Boy. Uh, hi, Pixie Knight 180. Thank you so much for the follow. Um, <laughs> if you are here and you are not already following 16 Bit Eric, what are you doing with your life? Follow 16 Bit Eric. Um, <laughs> honestly, League of Whimsy is one of the greatest communities that I've ever found online, uh, and you should be part of it. Um, <clears throat> for anybody who's new here, I am Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, uh, Community Collections Archivist at Virginia Tech, uh, known around the Twitcherverse as Rogan27. Um, and today we were looking, or we are looking at materials from um, the Heron Speculative Fiction Collection here at Virginia Tech. <clears throat> and we're focusing today particularly on advertisements in the pulp sci-fi magazines. Um, we've seen some rather interesting ones, and we just came across one that I have not completely done. So I'm going to start this one over here. Um, <laughs> Blue Rooster, you're not wrong. It's an interesting page. Not as yet as homoerotic as uh, a previous one that we looked at. <coughs> 
But this is the summer 1944 issue of Startling Stories. And there's an ad in here that is very... Be glad you missed the rupture. Yes, this is true. Uh, <clears throat> there's an ad in this magazine that is 100% the inspiration for a couple of lyrics in the Rocky Horror Picture Show. <clears throat> Shadows, you can watch. I did not anger my camera today. I, I have to manually adjust its positioning. Uh, I need to get... more technology in order to be able to move it more smoothly. <clears throat> yes, you can watch the VOD later if you want. I, I'll give you a quick glimpse of... Do you worry about rupture? We read the whole thing. I couldn't figure out what it was for. We had to do research. But <clears throat> this one is very definitely related to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Except that this ad was inspiration for some lyrics in the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Lend me 15 minutes a day and I'll prove I can make you a new man. I'm trading in old bodies for new. I'm taking men who know that the condition of their arms, shoulders, chests, and legs, their strength, wind, and endurance is not 100%, and I'm making new men of them. <clears throat> See, I have to move in closer because this is very fine type. <clears throat> I don't care how old or young you are or how ashamed of your present physical condition you may be. If you can simply raise your arm and flex it, I can add solid muscle to your biceps, yes, on each arm and in double quick time. I can broaden your shoulders, strengthen your back, develop your whole muscular system inside and outside. I can add inches to your chest, give you a vice-like grip, make those legs of yours lithe and powerful. I can shoot new strength into your old backbone, exercise those inner organs, help you cram your body so full of pep, vigor, and red-blooded vitality that you won't feel there's even standing room left for weakness and that lazy feeling. <clears throat> before, <clears throat> before I get through with you, I'll have your whole frame measured to a nice, new, beautiful suit of muscle. <clears throat> Here's what only 15 minutes a day can do for you. <clears throat> Are you all man, tough, muscled, on your toes every minute with all the up and at em that can lick your weight in wildcats? Or do you need the help I can give you? The help that has already worked. Such wonders for other fellows everywhere. <laughs> Thank you for dropping historical terms. We definitely need it. I was a 97-pound weakling. All the world knows. <clears throat> Come on, camera. All the world knows I was once a skinny, scrawny, 97-pound weakling. And now it knows that I won the title, the world's most perfectly developed man. Against all comers, how did I do it? How do I work miracles in the bodies of other men in only 15 minutes a day? The answer is dynamic tension, the amazing method I discovered and which changed me from a 97-pound weakling into the champion you see here. In just 15 minutes a day, right in the privacy of your own home, I'm ready to prove that dynamic tension can lay a new outfit of solid muscle over every inch of your body. Let me put new, smashing power into your arms and shoulders. Give you an armor shield of stomach muscle that laughs at punches, 
strengthen your legs into real columns of surging stamina. If lack of exercise or wrong living has weakened you inside, I'll get after that condition too and show you how it feels to live. Free! This famous book that tells you how to get a body that men respect and women admire. Almost two million men have sent for and read my book, Everlasting Health and Strength. It tells you exactly what dynamic tension can do. And it's packed with pictures that show you what it does. Results it has produced for other men. Results I want to prove it can do for you. If you are satisfied to take a back seat and be pushed around by other fellows week in, week out, you don't want this book. But if you want to learn how you can actually become a new man, right in the privacy of your own home and in only 15 minutes a day, then man, get the coupon into the mail to me as fast as your legs can get to the letterbox. Charles Atlas. Department 77F, 115 East, 23rd Street, New York, 10, New York. <clears throat> Charles Atlas, America's greatest builder of men. Among all the physical instructors and conditioners of men, only one name stands out. That name is Charles Atlas. In every part of the country, Charles Atlas is recognized as America's greatest builder of men. Almost two million men have written to him. Thousands upon thousands have put their physical development into his capable hands. And now that the call is for men capable of helping America meet and conquer any national emergency, many thousands of others, even those already in the country's army and navy, are calling upon Charles Atlas to build the kind of men America vitally needs. Actual photo of the man who holds the title, the world's most perfectly developed man. Here's proof right here. Results come so fast by your method that it seemed just as if some magician put on the pounds of solid muscle just where you want them. W.L. Missouri. Feel like a million dollars and have a 44-inch normal chest. A two-inch gain. L.A.S. Illinois. My doctor thinks your course is fine. Have you put two inches on my chest and a half inch on my neck? Or have put, sorry, B.L. in Oregon. Your book opened my eyes. One and a quarter inch gain on my biceps and one inch more on my chest. J.F. Pennsylvania. <clears throat> uh, and then, of course, there's the little coupon. And it's, it's, it's no risk to you. Just drop it in the mail. We're, they're not even asking for any money. <clears throat> Are you all, man? My <laughs> shadows. Uh, did he Captain America himself? Kind of, Hannah. That's what it sounds like. Um, I will say one thing. Strong men slash bodybuilders used to actually look not terrifying. I know. That is that is very... Um, that That is true. The musculature on Charles Atlas, the man who was given the title the world's most perfectly developed man is not the overly muscly zero body fat that gets highlighted today it's actual toned and useful muscle instead of just for show um hi obi-wan pez you love the leopard print very camp yes um, and Obi-Wan Pez, indeed, going to take Charles Atlas by the hand. Um, this, this ad literally is the inspiration for one of the songs in the Rocky Horror Picture Show. But maybe not this exact ad, but <clears throat> these Charles Atlas ads. Um...
I don't know the name of the song. Oh, it's just called the Charles Atlas song. Charles Atlas looks more attainable compared to the bodybuilders of today. I would agree. And and Shadows, you're not wrong. Bodybuilders, the, the ones, especially today, who are trying, going for like the big bulk and the very defined muscles with the very low body fat, the six or eight pack abs, <clears throat> that is all for show. It is not for power. If you look at strongman competitions, the men who win the strongman competitions look very different. They have fat on their bodies. They have functional muscle as opposed to muscle for show. Muscle for show, you're still strong, but it's not as effective for doing tasks that require strength. And so that's why if you if you compare winners of bodybuilding competitions to winners of strongman competitions, they have very different physiques. <clears throat> Even regular gym bros are often too built now. Yeah, I would agree. The Charles Atlas ads are not nearly as homo homoerotic as the last so-called fitness ad we looked at. This is this is true. Um, the last so-called fitness ad that we looked at was from 1930, and it, um, they were giving away a book to help promote the book that they wanted you to buy, um, and the book had 46 full-page illustrations of him and the men that he had helped to develop their physique. And it went on at length about how you were going to want to look at those photos. And it was pocket-sized. And you would never want to let it out of your hand. <laughs> uh, I have a six-pack under this keg. Exactly. Arnie S. compared to that guy who played... The Mountain in Game of Thrones. Oh, oh yes, yes. I don't know the actor's name either. <clears throat> you did a regimen that built lean muscle, involved a lot of lifting, extremely heavy, that you could still lift multiple times, and lifting until failure. Yeah, I was actually just reading, I saw a, a an article in uh, Men's Health today um, that basically was a circuit training of that type. I don't usually click on those articles, but that one caught my eye today. So, uh, not out of your hand, not hands. I, a book that was more like an annotated picture book than an actual fitness book. Exactly, Hannah. That's, that's how it came across at least. Um, this one, Famous Fantastic Mysteries, uh, this pulp is, let me see, I believe we're jumping to the 50s with this one. <clears throat> so published from 39 until 53, this is August of something, August of 1950. Um, you can see we still have that very iconic uh, pulp illustration style, which is probably one of my favorite art forms, or like art. I want to say genre. It's it's wrong though. Art styles. I love just the style of this art. <clears throat> um, not so much like. The women don't have to be scantily clad and but just like the style of the art itself uh let's see ah! well it is 1950. just plug in defrosto matic women won't let you take it out 
Revolutionary new device pays you $5 and more each as housewives and hand defrosting forever. Patented features make selling easy. <clears throat> so this is not an ad for the Defrostomatic. This is an ad to get men to sign up to sell the Defrostomatic. <laughs> Wait, what about H.G. Wells? Oh, the time machine. Which was already a classic in 1950, according to this. Um, <clears throat> 29 million prospects show housewives how to end forever the mean, nasty, time-wasting work of hand-defrosting refrigerators. Get a new thrill! Watch patented Defrost-O-Matic sell itself. Cash in up to $18 and more an hour. Make $5 to $6.50 on each easy demonstration. 29 million prospects eager to buy. Great automatic unit converts any electric refrigerator to the new self-defrosting type. Dramatic demonstration. Simply plug in. Demonstrates itself once housewives see how magically defrost o -matic saves time, saves food, saves money. They won't let you take it out. It defrosts every night automatically. No more ice-crusted coils, sloppy kitchen, or spoiling food. Rush coupon today for free information about amazing, sure selling plan. Easy as making a phone call. Clicks with 87 out of 100 prospects in homes, apartments, hospitals. We show you how to make the biggest money of your life. Join these men for exceptional profits weekly. <clears throat> oh gosh, then we have fine print. Yeah, MLM, Pyramid Scheme, multi-level marketing. I don't know that this is exactly that, but this has certainly developed into that over time. Received demonstrator today and sold five units first day out. James W. Little. Rush me 20 more defrost o -matics. Customers are calling at my home for them. Mrs. D.A. Kearney. I sold 96 units in three weeks, spare time. Clear profit over $600, John C. West. Sold first six defrost o -matics in two hours. Had no previous experience. It's wonderful, Leon B. Davis. I sold 19 out of first 20 calls. defrost o -matic is finest appliance I ever handled. George L. Dunavant. Act now, territory's going fast. <clears throat> and again, targeted at men. But this time they do have um, in the uh, testimonials at the bottom, one of their salespeople was Mrs. D.A. Kearney. So that's the first time, now that we're in the 50s, it's the first time we've seen one of their salespeople is a woman. <clears throat> Honestly, home demonstration agents, um, at least here at Tech, uh, some of our earliest home demonstration agents were women. Uh... And again, here, another, this, this other ad, this is from the Mason Shoe Manufacturing Company. And it's advert, it's not advertising the shoe. It's advertising trying to recruit salesmen to sell the shoes. That's interesting to me. Okay. This ad, <clears throat> what is this ad for? I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna 
Wait for some guesses. What do you think this ad is for? <clears throat> I can even give you a little bit of, um, of text. Those new cars are really something. And nowadays you can just about walk in and drive off in one, if you can afford it. Hats, a nice suit, not for the car. Any other guesses? Self-confidence lessons. Key squared, that's not a bad guess. <clears throat> so, a bank loan. Uh, Shadows, we're trying to guess what is this advertisement for? Um, as you can tell, once again, this famous Fantastic Mysteries uh, pulp magazine, the primary audience is men. This being 1950 now, those men, the primary target of this pulp magazine, are veterans of World War II, primarily. I mean, yes, they still have the, the target of... Um, younger boys who are reaching maturity who now are not automatically going into the military and being sent off to war. <clears throat> but their primary audience... Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, I know. Um, their primary audience is veterans of World War II. That's the age range that they're they're targeting. Um, and so we saw the previous two ads were trying to recruit people as salesmen to be a car salesman, to go along with the theme we've had so far. That's not a bad guess. Car insurance. Okay. <clears throat> are you just wishing? Those new cars are really something. And nowadays you can just about walk in and drive off in one if you can afford it. Will a promotion put a new car in your reach? ICS training may help you get that promotion. In just four months, 1,920 ICS students reported advancement in salary and position. They did it by studying at home in their spare time. The simple, practical, illustrated ICS texts made it easy. What these ICS students did, you can do. Start now. Mail the coupon today. International Correspondence Schools, approved under the GI Bill. Uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania, and you can study things such as air conditioning and plumbing. Air conditioning, heating, refrigeration, plumbing, steam fitting, chemical engineering, chemistry analytical, chemistry industrial, chemistry manufacturing iron and steel, petroleum refining, plastics, pulp and paper making, <clears throat> architecture, architectural drafting. Uh, this is uh, the 1950s equivalent of, um, what was the big one that advertised all the time in the 90s? Um, uh, what was it called? ITT Tech from the 90s. This is, this is the 1950s version of ITT Tech or today, uh, University of Phoenix Online. <clears throat> uh, so the, inner, the correspondence school was an actual school um, accredited to the point where money 
approved for education under the GI Bill could be used towards paying for these courses. But remember, the higher education system was very, very different in 1950. Oh, thank you, Bit Rebellious. <clears throat> so it wasn't until like the 1970s that uh, we really started pushing for everyone to go and get a bachelor's degree. And so then about 20 years later in the 1990s, it was, if you want a good job, you have to get a bachelor's degree. And you do that by getting student loans. Um, <clears throat> and then it's progressed to where we are today, where the costs just keep going up and it's okay, it's loans. Uh, but in the 1950s, there wasn't such a thing as a federal student loan. And there really weren't student loans. And college was cheap enough that you could go and work at the local diner and pay your tuition bill. So the GI Bill um, offered education to veterans who had served, but a lot of them were going to be looking for trades, not the sort of um, intellectual jobs that colleges aimed towards today. Uh, these weren't people that were gonna go to college to become a history teacher or become a physicist or they weren't going into it for the theory or the teaching or the research. These were people who were being offered some education to get a decent job in payment of an acknowledgement of their service in World War II but they were still mostly people who had come out of working class families and were looking to hone their skills in technical trades like air conditioning and plumbing, civil engineering, uh, mechanic, like being a, a mechanic, railroad courses on here, engineering stuff. They do have business and academics, so you've got <clears throat> Accounting and uh, applied psychology, um, tax, preparing taxes, uh, salesmanship, things like that. Those are on here as well, but the the world of higher education in the U.S. was extremely different in the 19, in 1950 than it is today. You talked to a grandparent over the phone yesterday at your job. She was telling you how she paid $5 a credit at LSU. Yeah. Like, it, it is stupendously different. And it is, um, I would say, incredibly stupendously different today than it was in the 90s when I started in undergrad. Um, This magazine also doesn't have lots of ads throughout. So there's the ones in the front and then we get some at the back. And that's about it. <laughs> Do they send you the chemicals you need? I don't know how you would get the lab time shadows. I'm guessing, um, <clears throat> I would assume that it's gonna be similar to doing uh, like a correspondence course as an auto mechanic today, where you're gonna do the study portion at home, but then you're gonna to have to do an in-person sort of practical um, on the job training or something like that at an actual shop where you have access to actual tools and can work on cars. Um, for some things, they could send you kits. Like if you were learning to be a locksmith, I know my dad uh, did a correspondence course in locksmithing um, in the 90s, and they sent him a kit to do the practical stuff. But yeah, chemical engineering, things like that, they're, they're not going to be sending you materials. So you're going to study the theory, 
but the in-person experience is going to be up to you to get. T figuring out how to teach science labs remotely ate up a lot of your life in 2020. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> and in this era, they couldn't fall back on simulations. Yeah. So I think, I think um, in many ways, this would have been a way to further the education and work towards a promotion for somebody, say, you already had a job doing heating and, air, uh, heating and air conditioning. Well, if you take some courses and get a certification of some sort, you might be able to get a promotion. So you had the opportunity to get some hands-on experience and by doing the education and taking those courses and getting a certification, you qualify to move up and become uh, a higher level employee and get paid more, things like that. Uh, so I know my brother, is an auto mechanic and um, he's gone through various training courses to be certified on certain types of automobiles. And then once they get those, once they get the appropriate certification, then they're able to work on those and they're actually can get paid more um, because they have those specific skills that others don't have. So like working on hybrid cars, uh, the hybrid gas electric cars requires an additional certification that a, a normal auto mechanic doesn't have to have. <clears throat> um, so we've got an ad for heart attack or indigestion. Really short ad here. Thank heavens. Most attacks are just acid indigestion. When it strikes, take Bell Ann's tablets. They contain the fastest medicines known to doctors for the relief of heartburn, gas, and similar distress. 25 cents. Bellons, B-E-L-L-A-N-S. That's a brand I've not heard of before. High school course at home. Many finish in two years. Go as rapidly as your time and abilities permit. Course equivalent to resident school work prepares for college entrance exams. Standard high school text is supplied. Uh, diploma... Does a uh, diploma credit for high school subjects already completed? Single subjects, if desired. High school education is very important for advancement in business and industry and socially. Don't be. <clears throat> um, don't be held back all your life. I, I don't know what word to put in there, but I'm not going to read that one. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> historical terms. Um, be a high school graduate. Start your training now. So again, this is another, before we had the trades courses, this is like high school, college, college prep courses. We know the primary target here is veterans of World War II. And we know from history that a lot of, a lot of high school age boys lied about their age so they could go off to war. So a lot of them left before they were done with high school. And getting a high school uh, certificate would be helpful for them. Tried to get an A-plus certification in high school to work on computers and stuff. I mean, yes, it's not the worst of words, but it is certainly one that is um, <clears throat> just one to be mindful of. Let's see. Uh, I love the toothache one here. Toothache? Quick relief with dents. Use dense tooth gum or dense tooth drops for cavity toothaches. Use dense dental poultice for pain or soreness in gums or teeth. All at drugstores. Since 1888. And you've got the person with the swelling and they've got the, the little kerchief tied up to you know keep their jaw closed and Uh, let's see. Let me get some fish bait. Another ad for a high school diploma. Athlete's foot with Dr. Scholl's. 1950. 
That's an that's a brand that's still around today and still selling products in this specific category. Athlete's foot, Dr. Scholl's fast relief and healing aid. Don't wait. Get Dr. Scholl's Solvex today. This famous prescription of Dr. Scholl's quickly relieves itching, kills fun fungi of athlete's foot on contact, aids rapid healing of red, raw, cracked, or peeling skin. Insist on Dr. Scholl's Solvex in liquid, ointment, or powder form. Dr. Scholl's Solvex. Itching, red, raw, cracked skin between teeth and on the be te between teeth. Sorry, between toes and on the feet. Between teeth, you do not want athlete's foot between your teeth. Um, if their motto isn't put a dent in pain, it should have been. Oh, shadows, that would have been good. And the little teardrops, yeah. It isn't. That would that that illustration is like the whole brand today. Like, it would just be that picture. Uh, we are gonna have to end soon. Oh, a gun lighter. And this one, maybe not exactly what you would expect from a gun lighter. <laughs> New gun lighter, looks real trigger action. Only $4.95. Precision made like real gun. Hard rubber rubber handle. Polished chrome finish. Perfect pocket size. Three inches by two and a half inches. Here it is. The automatic cigarette lighter. That's sweeping the country. Made exactly like a real gun. It's sure to fool your friends. When you take it out, they will gasp. Pull the trigger and you've got a sure light every time. Order yours today, $4.95, prepaid. We pay postage. Cash on delivery, you pay postage, plus cash on delivery charge. Either way, if not completely satisfied, return within five days for a full refund. Click Sales Company. Five, number Wabash Avenue, Chicago to Illinois. Department Q? Department G, sorry. You heard gum lighter, but it's it's a gun that's a light, like it's a lighter shaped like a gun and you pull the trigger to light it, but you don't light it from the barrel. It opens here. Which is in no way where I would expect the flame to come from. Anyway, um, <clears throat> okay. So every ad has been aimed at men. Is this one? This will be the last one that we have time for. I do have one other magazine here, which was Odyssey, but it's the 1970s, which is a bit of a jump. Um, and we're way over time. So uh, we'll we'll just end with this 1950 issue here. <clears throat> I believe that this ad is once again aimed at men because I believe, like we saw at the beginning of this volume, this is not an ad for the product being displayed. I think this is another ad to hire salesmen to sell the product being displayed. You can't lose. Have a profit-making business of your own. No money to invest. Nationally advertised products. For free sample outfits. No experience necessary. Full or part-time. A lifetime future. But here we go, Hannah. 
Man or woman, young or old, you can earn a steady income in full or spare time as an independent Kendex dealer. Amazing and almost impossible earnings can become a reality for you. Herbert Armstrong of Tennessee earned $202 in nine days. C.O. Watkins of Oregon sent 92 orders in one day. You have the same opportunity to duplicate these exceptional earnings. Over $1 million will be earned in 1950 by Kendex dealers. Why not let us establish you in your own business and get a share of these wonderful earnings? Um, just, just two decades, because it was 1929 where we started and this is 1950. <clears throat> in the movie A Walk in the Clouds, when Keanu Reeves' character comes back from the war, the job he got when he came back was a door-to-door -door -door chocolate salesman, which absolutely, based on these ads, would, would totally have been the kind of job somebody would have gotten. The majority of the ads in this issue here are not advertising the products that they feature. They are hiring salesmen to sell the products. Not men's hosiery. Shadows. They're selling women's nylons. Oh, no, men's hosiery, too. You're right. Are you questioning what that means? Because we can we can look at that. I didn't see that it said men's hosiery. Um, <clears throat> uh, Kendex nylons replace free. If they run or snag within guarantee period up to three months. Impossible. It's true. No matter what the cause, hard use or deliberate abuse, whether it is fault of the how uh, uh, fault of the hose or the wearer, Kendex nylons are replaced free if they run, snag, or become unfit for wear within the guarantee period. How could any woman resist a positive guarantee of satisfaction when she can obtain it without paying any more than other standard advertised brands? Kendex nylons are not sold in stores, so you have no competition. Complete line in... No competition. Sorry. Complete, no, complete line includes everything from heavy 70, uh, 70 denier service weight to gossamer luxurious ultra sheer 15 denier 60 gauge. Proportion sizes and lengths, latest colors plus white. I guess, were there not other brands that sell in stores and would those not be competition? I'm curious as to what happened to this company. Um, the, like, if it snags, we'll replace it guarantee. Wasn't there another, didn't like legs or something do that? Uh... Next corporation. I don't know. A quick search. I'm not sure that I'm able to find this specific company. It would take some research, I think. <clears throat> we will end in just one moment here. Lingerie, robes, house coats. Men's hose. In addition to the sensational Kendex nylons, you will have a complete line of glamorous lingerie, beautiful robes and house coats, plus a complete line of uh, Kent Craft men's hosiery, guaranteed for one full year. Any pair of pair, any pair or pairs of men's hose that does not give satisfactory wear within one year of purchase will be replaced free. Okay, so men's hosiery. This is Kent Craft. Uh, am I? I did not want that. Thank you so much for trying to correct me, but I spelled it correctly.
I'm looking to see like this actual, I found this actual page um, that doesn't actually depict. Um, no, I didn't. Um, see, I've, I've seen the term mostly in reference to like men's, like men's socks, like dress socks and things like that, um, is what would count as men's hosiery. This sounds like nylons. And I don't know enough about 1950s uh, men's underclothing, undergarments to know for sure if that was really a thing. But I imagine it probably was. I'm not getting any quick and like <clears throat> easy explanations from from a quick internet search. Um, but this talks about men's hose and again does not give satisfactory wear and it's similar phrasing to how they talk about the women's nylons. That it 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 definitely feels like where they're talking about men's hosiery here, they're actually talking about men's hose, like pantyhose. I don't know for certain though. I've always heard men's hosiery as a term um, that that was looking at like men's socks, like dress socks, like the ones that you would clip to hold up with garters. They wore similar stockings. Okay, thank you, Blue Opal. Um, yeah, so. Different product, but similar. Um, <clears throat> we do need to end the stream, though, because we are well over time. Um, we'll just, we'll leave with this sad clown B.F. Goodrich ad. B.F. Goodrich is a, um, if you're unfamiliar, it is an American tire company. Um, and they were... I don't know if this is a very, is a specific... This is apparently Emmett Kelly, the world's most famous circus clown. You tried looking up a wiki page and got men in tights. <laughs> Tight tights, indeed. Um, okay, I do have to end the stream. I never want to end this stream. I enjoy this stream too much. It is too much fun. Um, but sadly, we do have to say goodnight. Uh, I have to head home. And um, I'm sure you all have things to do as well. But uh, there will not be an episode of Archival Adventures next week. Next week is July 3rd. Um, and because of the proximity to the holiday in the United States, I will not have an episode um, next Wednesday. So the next episode will be the following Wednesday, which is in July. And I was, thank you so much computer for not giving me the date. Um, 
I clicked on a place that should have had the date and didn't have the date. Uh, the next episode will be July 10th. I could have just added seven, but my brain wouldn't do it. Um, <clears throat> we will be doing uh, our normal beginning of the month um, USS Dakota. So we'll be picking up where we left off just after reportedly President Lincoln went up in a balloon. Uh, we'll, we'll pick up there in the journal of the chief engineer of the USS Dakota during the American Civil War. Um, and that will be on Wednesday, July 10th. Uh, so hopefully I will see some of you then. Let me go ahead and figure out where we're going to raid. Um, I have not looked yet to see who might be on. Um, but let me just see what's what's about. Um, shorebirds in the aviary cam. We've got... I just... Because we can, and because the dinosaur dig continues... Uh, those of you on the Rogan 27 channel where I can raid paleontologizing... Um, we're going to pop on over to Paleontologizing because dinosaur dig. Uh, they have a few days left in Wyoming on this dig. And so we're going to pop on over there and support them. Um, I have not previously been able to raid them from the library's account. I will try, but I have a feeling it's not going to work. And if it doesn't, then um, the library account will head over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, but thank you all so much for joining me today. I hope that I will see all of you again soon. Um, and whew, too many things to click. Yeah, it is not working for the uh, library's account. So the library uh, channel is going to head to Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for joining me. I hope I see you again soon. Until I do. Keep exploring history, everybody. <laughs>